If you're into martial arts movies and fighting games, 1994 was a great year. Now, why is that? 1994 gave us what I consider to be two of what are not only the best martial arts films to come out of Hong Kong, but two of the best martial arts movies ever made. These films being Fist of Legend and The Legend of the Drunken Master 2. FYI, 30% of a good kung fu movie is putting legend in the title. Fist of Legend is Jet Li's best film and showcases just how impressive his fighting and athletic abilities can be. It was also the breakout film for fight choreographer Young Wu Ping, who went on to international success with his choreography in the Matrix films. Fist of Legend exemplifies Wu Ping's style with its precise strikes and stunning wire work. Every fan of The Matrix needs to go back and watch this movie. I like Keanu, but he is no Jet Li. Not to be outdone, Jackie Chan released his masterpiece, Legend of the Drunken Master 2. Following in the footsteps of its predecessor, Drunken Master 2 is like the T2 of Kung Fu movies. It takes everything that worked in the first movie and turns it up to 11. The punches are harder, the kicks are faster, and the action is more intense, creating the best of Jackie's period films, as well as featuring his best hand-to-hand -hand fight choreography. Not only that, it features Ho Sung Pak. My name is Ho Sung Pak. I... I'm an actor in real life. I play a character named Liu Kang. That's right, Jackie Chan versus Liu Kang. If that doesn't qualify as fucking awesome, I don't know what does. Speaking of Mortal Kombat, 94 also saw the home release of Mortal Kombat 2, which is considered by many, myself included, to be the best in the series. Competing for the attention of fighting game fans was the often imitated and never duplicated Super Street Fighter 2. Although not as good as Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, if you were rocking the Genesis or Super Nintendo, Super Street Fighter 2 was the best way to bring the arcade experience home. Now, if that wasn't enough to make fighting fans cream in their pants like a middle-aged man looking at Kim Kardashian's newest ass shot, 94 gave us the theatrical release of Street Fighter 2, the animated movie. Like a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, Street Fighter 2, the animated movie is the best of both worlds. It takes fighting games and martial arts cinema and puts it in the anime blender. The result is a movie so potent with badassness, it'll make your brain melt. Directed by Gisaburo Sugi from Touch and Night on the Galactic Railroad, Street Fighter 2 managed to take the game and adapt it into an anime without losing the core appeal of what made the game a classic. It not only adapts the story and characters, but also manages to adapt the tone of the games as well. Even though I love the Mortal Kombat movie, it doesn't fully capture the feel of the games. That's not the case with Street Fighter. Street Fighter 2 the animated movie makes you feel like you're playing Super Street Fighter 2. So much so that after watching the film for this review, I had to bust out my copy of Super Street Fighter 2 and get in a few rounds. <sighs> Cold and old fashioned, but there really isn't anything more relaxing than playing Super Street Fighter 2 on a Super Nintendo while drinking a nice cold bottle of Bud. You know, I appreciate the producers called the movie Street Fighter 2 and not Street Fighter like some people, but that's actually a misnomer. See, these are the characters in Street Fighter 2. This movie features characters from Super Street Fighter 2 The New Challengers, like Kami, T. Fei Long, DJ, Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> Like any good martial arts film, the strength of Street Fighter 2, the animated movie, comes from its fight scenes. The fight scenes in Street Fighter 2 have an immense sense of weight and speed. It feels like the characters are inhabiting the space they're in. A lot of anime fights in this period were hyper-stylized. They took the fight so far into the realm of fantasy, it stopped feeling like two people actually fighting. Which is fine, but going back to Yun Wu Ping, if the fight choreography of Dragon Ball Z is similar to The Matrix Reloaded, then the fight choreography of Street Fighter II the animated movie is similar to the original Matrix. The fights have a stripped down grittiness to them, and they really make you feel every hit. Which is no mistake, because the fights in Street Fighter II were choreographed by K1 founder Kazuyoshi Ishii and champion kickboxer Andy Hug. The best example of the full contact style of Street Fighter 2 is seen in the fight with Chun-Li and Vega. Taking the aggressive style of Hug, Sugi manages to turn Chun-Li vs. Vega into a bloody, no-holds-barred brawl. I've seen Chun-Li and Vega fight plenty of times in the game, but this fight is brutal. It hurts to watch. The fight is the centerpiece of this movie, and it really channels the energy of a real-life kickboxing match. Every punch is vicious, and Vega's claws have never been deadlier. It's also worth mentioning the opening fight between Ryu and Sagat. This fight isn't as technically proficient as Chun-Li vs. Vega, but this fight isn't about that, it's about the mood. 
Similar to what Gareth Evans would do 20 years later with The Raid, the Ryu vs. Sagat fight is all about setting up atmosphere and the mindset of the fighter. The camera pans and fades in and out, letting the viewer feel the anticipation of the fighters. You see, some directors think a good fight is all about hitting each other and smashing into stuff, but other, more considerate directors know that when two characters of equal ability are facing off with each other, the fight will not be a wall-to-wall -wall slobber knocker, it'll be slow and calculated. It's like a chess game. Each one can knock the other out with one move, so they have to consider each move carefully. Both fighters wait slowly for their opening and make each strike quick and deliberate. We may have missed out on Tyson vs. Holyfield in the early 90s, but this fight more than makes up for it. Adding to the tension in the scene is the soundtrack composed by Tetsuya Komuro. The simple guitar riff is very cool and definitely gets your blood pumping for the rest of the movie. Although his music does kind of fall flat as the movie goes on, maybe it's because I didn't grow up in Japan, but the J-Rock, J-Pop songs don't always seem to fit. It might be because I'm a stupid American, but as far as I'm concerned, the dubbed version with the grunge soundtrack is light years ahead of the Japanese version. I love when the movie cuts to Seattle and Silverchair starts playing. Actually, it would make more sense for Allison Chains to start playing, being that they're from Seattle. The grunge music really gives the film a sense of time and place that's missing in the Japanese version. Overall, I think the American cast does a better job with the characters than the Japanese cast. Blasphemous, I know. A good example is Goken, Ken and Ryu's master. In the Japanese version, he sounds frail and weak. The American one has a strong and commanding voice. As he should, he trained two of the greatest fighters in the world. He also says cool shit like, Ken, what do you see beyond your fist? I also like American Ryu. He sounds like what Ryu should sound like. I don't know what's going on with Japanese Ryu. The voice actor Kojiro Shimizu is doing some weird Clint Eastwood whisper thing that doesn't really work. You know, sometimes less is more, and other times less is less. Okay, I know what you're saying. But Paul, what about the story? Alright, let's talk about the story. Spoiler warnings for anyone who cares, because I know how sensitive people can be with plot details. Fucking people with their spoilers. The movie's been out for 20 years! The story is definitely the weakest part of the film, but it's also the weakest part of the game. Actually, I don't think the plot is all that bad, and they do a good job of making sense of the game's story. The story to the Street Fighter 2 video game is basically M. Bison holds a tournament called the World Warrior Tournament and fighters from around the world enter. That's it. Every character has different motivations for entering the tournament, like Ryu wants to be a better fighter, Chun-Li wants revenge, Guile wants revenge, Ken wants to fight Ryu. There's no big thing pushing the story forward like Mortal Kombat. The movie takes all character motivation from the games but removes the World Warrior Tournament. Now, Bison has sent monitor cyborgs all over the world to collect fighters and their data so he can use them in his psycho experiments to become a stronger fighter and ultimately take over the world. <laughs> it's fucking ridiculous. But the story exists as a way to set up the action. Things only happen so characters can start fighting. This is a touchstone of martial arts films. Also, with the amount of characters in Super Street Fighter 2, the film does a good job of introducing them all, keeping them all relevant to the plot, and giving them all a moment to shine. Front and center is the relationship between Ken and Ryu, as it should be, given that they are the heart and soul of the Street Fighter series and the heart and soul of this film. Dramatically, the Ryu and Ken flashback scenes are the best in the film. Both the American and Japanese actors do a great job of imbuing their characters with nuance and subtle emotions. And if that isn't enough, if it wasn't for these scenes, we wouldn't have Street Fighter Alpha. The movie also explores the relationship between Guile and Chun-Li, which I liked and I wish there was more of. They kind of have a mismatch buddy cop thing going on. I wish they would give them a spin-off. I don't know why, but a action rom-com with Guile and Chun-Li sounds fucking amazing. Now, there are plenty of plot holes and things that don't add up, like, why are T-Hawk and Ken fighting in this warehouse? Was Ken just hanging out there and T-Hawk showed up? How will collecting the fight data from Street Fighters help Bison to take over the world? Why did Guile and Chun-Li get into a plane to tell DJ Bison is watching him? They don't have phones? What the hell happened to Sagat? Did he kill Kami? If Ryu and Ken were fighting Bison near the Laotian border, how did Eliza pick up Ken? Did she drive from Seattle to Laos? Why is Bison in that truck? Why the fuck is Donnie in this 
If you're one of those people asking these questions, you are missing the point. The plot doesn't matter. The action is what's important. Now, someone once begged the question, If all you wanted from a Street Fighter movie was awesome fight scenes, then why not just play the video game? Okay, dude, here is my answer. This is not equal to this. <laughs> And this is not equal to this. And this is not equal to this. Action in games and action in film is enjoyed differently. Action in games is about participation. Action in film is about spectacle. By that logic, if all you wanted from a Street Fighter movie was awesome fight scenes, then why not just play the video game? By your logic, there's no point in watching the Fast and the Furious movies because you could always just play the Need for Speed. At least that way you don't have to be assaulted by corn at the end of it. Eesh. What the fuck is wrong with corn? What kind of shit are you listening to? Another interesting thing worth mentioning is the different versions of the film that exist. The copy that I have is the 2006 DVD release by Manga Entertainment. It contains the original uncut Japanese version as well as a slightly cut, three minutes shorter English version. From what I understand, the English version cuts some language, shortens the intro, and takes out chunks of the Chun-Li shower scene. Since we're on the topic, let's talk about the Chun-Li shower scene. Some people call it gratuitous and unnecessary, but I like it, and it's one of my favorite parts of the film. And not just for the obvious reasons. I like it for obvious reasons. Going back to atmosphere and tone, the tranquility of this scene is meant to juxtapose the future fight with Vega. Sugi is giving you some quiet breathing room and lulling you into a false sense of security. Because in a couple of minutes, shit is about to get real. Like a magic trick, this is what good filmmaking does. It draws your attention to one area as it sets up the action in another area. You can call it cinematic sleight of hand. Also, pubes! So in closing, I want to recommend Street Fighter II the animated movie to fighting game fans and martial arts movie buffs, and I want to let them know if you give this one a shot, you will not be disappointed. 